Hi, this is Casey Glass for Worship Synths, and we're going to do a little advanced tutorial today on how to sample instruments into the Nord Stage 2. And actually, this would also work for uh, the more uh, recent Electro models or the Stage Piano or the Nord Wave, other, any of the other Nord instruments that can access the Nord Sample Library. And I'll point out kind of the, the special steps there. Uh, first of all, you need something that you can sample. Please do check the licensing agreements of the things you're sampling so that you aren't breaking the law. And uh, in this case, I'm going to sample for my own use one of Mr. Abel Mendoza's uh, pads from, uh, I think this is Sensation Volume 2. And so here I am in Logic, and I've just kind of opened up a concert, and I've put his patch uh, over on this side. And there are a couple of things we want to kind of set up here. So first thing we want to do is make sure that in Logic, we have our preferences set to, uh, let's see here, if I go to preferences, MIDI, that we have, uh, it might be under general. Eh, it might not be. Let's see, where is it going to be? Advanced maybe? No. Here we go. So under display, we want to make sure that we have C4 is middle C, and that is because for Nord, uh, C4 is also middle C, and that'll make sure our samples don't end up an octave off when we hit them over into the Nord sample editor. So, once we've got that set up, we are going to go ahead and make a MIDI region, and we can do that with the pencil tool, and we're going to go ahead and lay out the intervals that we're going to record for our raw samples in the sample editor. If you want a really small sample, if you're sampling something simple, you could probably go with octaves or even a single note. Uh, I found that the sample editor does a decent job kind of stretching and um, pitch shifting things so that they sound pretty good. What I typically do if I want something that sounds pretty faithful for the original is to go in fourths, uh, which is C, uh, E flat, and then G sharp, and then C again. Uh, or in this case, I've done six, which is C and then F sharp, C, F sharp, all the way up through. And you can do any octave that you want. Sometimes actually staying away from C and kind of starting a little bit farther down at B or A is kind of nice, depending on what kind of keys you usually play in. And so we're going to set it up so that we have even intervals all the way across the range that we're going to sample. I usually sample up to about C6 or C7 and down to C2. And then I let that last note be pitch shifted into any other range that we need. The other thing we want to do is make sure that these are constant velocity notes. So what I'll do is create the first note, and I'll make sure it's at about velocity 100. And then you'll see that I have the scale pretty compressed here, and each of these notes is two bars long at a tempo of 120 beats per minute, which makes them uh, eight seconds. And that'll make sure that we have a nice solid chunk to loop in the sample editor. So what we're going to do now is just go through and bounce this out as audio. So we can actually go to uh, da, 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 file export file, export region as audio file. And I'm just going to save this somewhere. And this is the aftermath. Oh, I forgot one other thing. Before we do that, we want to make sure that we strip out anything that we don't want in the sample, like things that we're going to add back in hardware. So I turned off the reverb that's already been added to this patch. There are no sends for this patch, so there's not other stuff happening on buses that I don't have control over. I'm going to leave the EQ in place. Uh, and this patch also has a tempo synced LFO, and I turned that off just because uh, I won't be able to tempo sync it later. And so it's better just to leave it out, and we can add that back in with the LFO in the stage if we need to. All right, so. We'll go ahead and bounce that out. I actually have a folder for these things. And this is going to be SV2 Aftermath. All righty. And we're going to bounce that out as a wave. We can leave it at 16 bit. And there we go. So it's going to bounce it for me. And we're done. Okay, so now we're in the Nord sample editor. A couple of things we want to make sure of. First off is that uh, in the menu bar that's above my recording window here, you can go to settings and then audio. 
and it'll bring up a window to select your audio device so they can play back sounds to you. The other thing we want to do is go to a file, save project as, and save this right from the get-go so we're ready to have this stored somewhere. Then I'm going to add in our music file. Whoops. There we go. And this is SV2 Aftermath. And then we need to tell it where we started sampling. That was C2. And what the interval for the samples is. In this case, it's six semitones. You can change that. And then at what audio threshold to split the samples. And we're just going to go ahead and assign those across the keyboard. And you'll see that it has located each of the samples and placed them across the keyboard. Sometimes you'll have an error here, like for example, let's we'll drag this all the way down and we'll try again. And you see that it kept all this as one big sample and then has these others. So that's incorrect. You can both manually correct that. So we can go ahead and assign that as a sample. Or you can just change your threshold until you get a threshold that will split them correctly. There we go. Oh, it was still at 80, even though I changed it to 70. Let's try that. Hey, there we go. Oh, it has an extra little bitty one in there. No, it doesn't. That's just where my cursor was. All right, great. Now I've got samples. And we can change that a little bit. Like it's cutting off a little bit of the samples over here. So we'll just see if we can get those in. Oh, we're going the wrong way. Let's try that. Bingo. All right, we're good to go. So after we have properly assigned our samples across the keyboard, and we can look up here and see that those are, in fact, the notes that we sampled uh, located up there. And it's also showing you which way it's stretching the notes. So for example, here's C6, and this is the darker gray, and it's being stretched down to B flat and then up to uh, D sharp or E flat. So. Um, we can see which range those notes are going into. Now we're going to go into the sample looping part, and we're going to pick C4 just as an example here. So this is the whole waveform. It shows you where it's going to start playing and then how far out it's going to go. Down here we have the scale, so we can just kind of pan through it with the slider bar, and we can also kind of change the, the overall magnification of the waveform. So kind of how much space is in the window that we're looking at. Uh, that looks pretty good. What we're looking at over here is the extrapolated waveform. So when it's looping, what is it going to be playing? And this is what that is. And then we can also change the height of the waveform down here, which can be pretty handy to get a good looping uh, piece going. Down here we have our controls for how much looping we're going to do. So we can also view the actual... Uh, waveform amplitudes on the right and left channels if we're going to try to tie that up real, real tight. And it's going to show the loop portion over the original portion. And so the loop portion, I believe, is the green part, and the red part is the original waveform. So we can try to get those to match up as best we can. For most of the things we're going to do, it's not important to have a perfect loop. It just needs to be pretty good, and we can clean that up a lot with the crossfade. So when we crossfade, we can cover up any pulsing or beating of the waveform. And then if we want to hear what it sounds like, we just hit play. So we can hear that that is not working out. There's a pretty solid beating in there. So we could try moving that up a little bit. It's still beating quite a lot, so we can try to increase the length of our loop and see if that helps. Another thing we can do is increase our crossfade. Oh. 
it's usually helpful if you increase your crossfade time, you're going to have to decrease the length of your loop a little bit so that you don't run out of waveform space. One thing I don't like is the sample editor won't let you drag it. It just jumps to wherever you click. So that's better and we could just keep playing with that till we get it just right if you're looking to loop really uh, super accurately that's what this uh, trim the view trim graph is for so we can try to literally line up waveforms uh, for complex waveforms that's gonna be pretty hard to do for simpler ones you can definitely get it to line up pretty well if you play with it long enough so we're gonna do this for literally each of these waveforms so uh, I'm going to stop the video now, and I'll come back when we finish that up. Okay, I've gone ahead and looped all of the samples, and your success at looping them will depend a lot on how much time you want to spend and how good your waveforms were. I'd say if you have trouble looping, you probably didn't have a long enough stem to start with, so go back and re-record your wave files with a longer note length, and that will give you a little bit more to work with. Also, with so, uh, sounds that evolve quite a bit over their duration, it's going to be just hard in general to loop them. And so use a long crossfade and uh, just see what you can do. Another couple other quick tips for looping. Sometimes a shorter crossfade works better. For here, I have a really short one. And that just kind of worked better for this particular sound. Can still hear it in there a good little bit but it can be tricky the other thing is to vary your uh, sample start times and uh, loop lengths uh, I'm sorry your loop start times and loop lengths and that will make sure that as you're playing the sound on a keyboard all of your loop uh, starts won't start at the same time they won't last for the same amount of time that will cover up a lot of uh, flaws in your looping um, and so that's kind of the, the loop preparation part. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is go to sample start. And for this, it can be helpful to kind of really increase the magnification. Personally, I generally want the samples to start at the beginning of the sound. And so we're just going to go through here and set all these to the actual start of the sample that it has. What we're seeing here is all of the wave that we found when we did the audio file assign. So if you're finding that your samples already are cut off a little bit, and these are a touch and I don't mind that, then you just need to reassign with a different uh, sample separation threshold. Or alternatively, you can just bring the files in individually as individual notes. That's of course a little bit more of a headache, but you can do that as well. And there we go. All right, so I've made sure that the start is all the way at the beginning of each uh, wave. And then another thing that can be pretty handy is to go ahead and uh, identify an alternative start point for uh, each of the waves. And this can help cut off any uh, uh, attack. Like if the attack was slow on the original uh, waveform, you can go ahead and set an alternate start that will trim that off to whenever the wave is loud and that will help to create new attack envelopes if you want to readjust that. And this is what the um, shape knob does when you're using samples as waveforms on the stage is it can move the sample to the new attack time and let you do some other things with it. So I usually like to record it with its original attack envelope and then I can go ahead and trim that up if I need to on the stage with the alternate start. 
There we go. So now here's the final point where we're going to make any changes to how the samples sound. Uh, the software is going to try to go ahead and match the volume envelope of all of the samples so that they have equal loudness. However, that's not usually what we want. If we recorded everything at equal velocity, we generally want to play back with that same velocity profile. And so I will usually go through and I will just hit reset all to make sure all the gains are the same. And it looks like we're all looking pretty good here. Here you can set global game and if the over thing, overall the patch came out too quiet, you can change that. You can change individual sample gain. It's like if we needed to make the sample louder or quieter, we could do that. Okay. Um, we can change the gain per note across the keyboard. So if we find that uh, for some reason with a particular note, there's phase cancellation there and it just is not quite the right loudness, we can fix that. You can also uh, set the overall sample range. If we want to make sure that it does not extend the samples too far uh, into the low range or the high range, we can just make sure that it cuts off at that point. Transpose the samples, uh, change the map. And if, for example, we want it to not be pitch shifting samples, like we've sampled in drum instruments, for example, uh, we can set that to unpitched. There are a couple of other things that we can do here. Uh, this is where we'll set up uh, the preset parameters for uh, non-stage synths. So like if you were to recall the file at its default, this is kind of what it would come up with. And on an electro, these are the settings that will it will play with. So we can set a filter envelope. So if we want it to have a low pass filter at a certain frequency, we can do that. We can set the attack time. We'll make it short. Uh, amplitude responsiveness for a pad. I usually would do low. Decay time. Usually I would do long for a pad. Release time. Um, actually, sorry, no decay time. Uh, let's do medium two for release time. We don't want to shift it at all. And then lastly, we can look at our slots on the Nord and figure out where we're going to be putting this. So let's just go ahead and the final step is to actually generate the instrument. And I'm not going to put it onto the Nord right now. And we have put it together and it's about 4.6 megabytes, which is uh, in my experience, about average for long loop, um, multi-note per octave uh, samples. And you can certainly do less than this if you are doing mono or if you are doing uh, less notes per octave, but that's probably about average. And then we can just save the project again. And we are all set. So that's kind of an extended tutorial. Uh, again, kind of big picture ideas that you want to make sure about is that you work on your loop points to try to get those as clean as you can. It's very helpful to set an alternate start point so that you can change uh, the amplitude envelope of that sound. And then you want to make sure that uh, the sample editor is not messing with your samples too much here in the instrument uh, edit panel. Make sure your gains are kind of set at zero so that you're getting out what you put into it. Um, and it can be helpful if you're using an instrument that's not a stage or if you're going to share your presets to go ahead and set some basics under the sample preset. So that's it. This is Casey Glass for Worship Synths. I hope that was helpful for you. So enjoy.